Uh, yes, hello everyone. While um, the panelists are, are taking the seats, let me let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Jakub Christoph, and I'm the Secretary General of CPS. CPS is an European organization that associates computer societies of Europe. And uh, through our members, we represent more or less 200,000 uh, IT professionals across Europe. Well, 40% of them are British, but you cannot win them all. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, what, I, what I need to say straight away, I'm not an uh, IT professional myself, yet I'm representing uh, computer societies of, of, of Europe. And, well, there is a pattern here as well, because we will be in this panel talking about building accessibility into the design and development of digital services. And uh, again, if you're looking an answer from me, <laughs> you're not going to get it, um, because uh, I have only the vague idea. So you see the pattern here, always the bridesmaid. Uh, anyhow, fortunately, I'm joined here by uh, people who uh, are very much the accessibility champions. They are uh, designers, accessibility engineers, front, uh, heads of front development. So maybe if I can ask each one of you to, to introduce yourself very shortly and mention uh, the organizations that you are coming from, uh, that would be great. Okay, I'll start. My name is Aoife and I'm the newly appointed head of design and content at OGCIO. So I just want to stress newly appointed there. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Mick Keen. I'm an accessibility engineer with a company called Optum, which is a healthcare insurance company um, over in the States. Uh, hi all, I'm Bridget, and uh, I work for the ESB as a design lead. Hi everyone, my name is Brendan McDonough, and I'm the head of front-end development at a web agency called Kuba, based in Dublin. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Duffy. I work as a UX researcher with HSC Digital Team. Uh, thank you very much, Sorka, um, and and everyone else as well. Um, before before I get on to the questions, and I must warn you, some of the questions would be repetitive to what you asked for the first panel. But I've got my proof here that I wrote them first. So, uh, uh, but anyhow, uh, I would like to start with the with the setting the scene by asking uh, Eva. If you can tell us a little bit more uh, what uh, you in your new role um, are doing uh, with uh, Office of the Government CIO in terms of the accessibility. Okay, so I have uh, two slides that we'll hopefully be able to, to go through now. Yeah, that's it, OGCIO. So really what I just want to, to go through and just raise awareness is uh, on the work of the OGCIO and um, really we're on a journey. Uh, our journey is to better digital services, better public services and, and in that and as part of that journey we're prioritizing accessibility and you know it's really about uh, making sure we have right practices in place. Uh, what we have and just ways in what, how we're doing that is we brought in an accessibility expert uh, to vet what we do uh, and then, as Virgil has already said earlier on, is uh, in terms of accessibility, it's now built in to our formal test suite uh, under uh, SDLC, so our uh, Software Development Lifecycle. Um, and, you know, we also then meet regularly with the NDA, and that's just providing us with advice and mentorship, you know, and we learn so much from them. Uh, and I suppose, really, just touching on growth, you know, we have grown uh, a lot over the last while and, and the key elements to that are people, process and technology and the people really and I suppose as I say I'm newly in uh, in, in OGC, uh, in, well in this role I, I'm new, I'm in OGC a while but what I've noticed is that the passion in the content designers, my team, the QA, everyone in, in OGCIO and, and what we have for accessibility. And I think that's a really uh, important uh, thing to mention. Uh, but also then, as I say, the skills, the right skills, using them in terms of 
processes then changing, making changes, the right changes that we need to as we learn uh, what needs to come in, audits, and then the technology. So those, uh, the mentorship and advice that we get from, from, from NDA, we're using the NDA recommended tools and uh, you know, leveraging their scans and that. And, and what I'm showing here on the, the screen is, it's a bar chart basically just showing you in April of 2024, where we were at in terms of accessibility uh, test coverage growth. And you can see there that 40% uh, for gov.ee pages um, in April. And just taking into account everything that I've just said there, you know, and those practices that we have, it's just demonstrating that now we're at a 95%, which is 55% growth. And the same for Ireland.ee, it was at a 20 20% and it is now at 95% as well and uh, or, sorry that's a 75% growth and then for the digital wallet just to say that's a, 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 I'm going to get onto that in a, a, in a minute but that is just something new and it's just demonstrating that you know with starting off at a 14 40% there is only 16 pages in that but it's just the same practices and and the policies and everything that we have in place to ensure that we are going to, we're committed to this and as i say it's a priority for us so so it's just in that and what I'm going to do is just uh, play a video uh, because there's a lot of information in this. And I think, Kathy, you've asked a question previously. Um, but as I say, you know, our, our journey, it's, it's, it's about uh, better and, and digital services uh, for all. And really what we're doing is building blocks. So the digital service unit is creating building blocks. Uh, and it really does touch on your point, Kathy, earlier on. So really what we're doing, that there's the reusable reusable software parts. And they're the key really here is that they are they have accessibility baked in from the start. And what each one of the tools that you can see on the screen, so that's life events portal, we've got messaging, forms, uh, payments, building block, they all have uh, and they all meet the web accessibility uh, directive, so the EU web accessibility directive. And uh, you know, I don't want to touch. I don't want to go into too much detail on it. But basically, if you would like to, I would urge you to to reach out to us through our website blocks.gov.ie if you want to learn more uh, about what we're actually trying to achieve there. About the, uh, and that's it. I think. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Aoife. Um, I'm wondering if there are any straightaway questions to Aoife about the building blocks or, um, or, or anything else at this stage before, before we move on to, to the, the next questions. Not at the moment. Or is there anyone online? Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll, we'll come back. So yes, let's let's dive straight into it. And um, Bridget, uh, how how do you embed uh, the accessibility into the design process? Or you, as a as a person who who's been working on the design at the uh, at the ESB, how how do you do it within your organizations? And what is your experience here? Um. Yeah, uh, to, to start asking, answering that question, I suppose I'll just quickly cover the why. Um, a bit like Donal mentioned earlier, it's around designing for all that we take that approach. Um, and that links very directly to inclusion. And therefore, the accessibility piece is a core component. Uh, so when we work with teams, we're bringing the why to begin with uh, and getting them on board. So it's a bit like Eva mentioned around passion. Uh, then how we operationalize it is that we, um, we broke it out into, I suppose, four key areas. Um, the first one would be that we built a design system. Uh, so again, like John and Aoife were covering there earlier, it's those reusable components. Uh, we would have began at the brand, um, because that's where we found a lot of our issues were coming from, um, just not having the brand guidelines in place that we needed. Um, and then from there, we created, uh, through Figma design systems and uh, code building blocks, we, we've put them in place. Um, and then, as, as part of this, I suppose, look, the, the key thing is that we have UX, UI engineers, developers, and um, product designers working together in order to do this. So, so that really covers how we, we were able to bring through this system. 
Um, the second piece that we have done, it's, it's an inclusive design process, we call it, but it just means what we've looked at is uh, a normal user experience design process and layered in um, stage gates with experts very much uh, in the room, Josh and Brian are two of them, who check all of our components in our design system and then they are part of our design process from the start. Uh, so they will look at our journeys, tell us where we've gone wrong, or, or misuse of components, and so they catch a lot of things very early on. Now, things still do get through, and uh, we're not perfect. Um, then the third piece was that we very much have an integrated team approach, so we work not just for teams, but also within them. Uh, so even though we provide the design system code libraries, uh, we are actually designers on products as well. Um, and if it's not us designing, we are helping teams to find the right designers. Um, so it's we're very engaged in the process end to end and uh, InterAxis are part of those stage gates as well throughout the design process in that they, they, they very much, it's beyond colour contrast, it is actually the usability that we talk about there. Um, and then I suppose look, the last thing that we have is, it is that DevSecOps within ESB, um, we've moved towards that shift and left. Uh, so there is a part of our test process is that we have the guys from Interaxis again, review us. <laughs> so really, we, they, are, they are our gatekeepers going forward in some ways, um, but they are the ones who are really supporting us to learn in this space. And I know that our designers and developers have learned a huge amount over the last couple of years. Um, but it, it really is that collaborative team effort that everyone here is talking about. Uh, it's not one person that can do it. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone else on the, on the panel has also the, the, do you all have the experience of having this holistic approach within your organizations that basically that underlines certain accessibility culture or is it, is it more like a, a siloed thing as, as we've heard from, from the previous uh, panels? I think it's definitely like an organic kind of growth thing for us. I think it starts very much with that one person like we've heard before like having a champion but like what we try to do now is have a minimum level of education throughout the entire agency so for us we're mainly designers and developers but even for marketing project management we want to educate everyone to like a minimum level of understanding and that's where the culture kind of passes through and um, we found that by doing that and even building that into your onboarding process or we've done things where we're looking to educate outside and we've ended up hiring people from courses where we've done things to educate them. And they've come in with the pre-approved culture that we want to go for. So there's a lot of different ways you can you can approach it in that sense. But um, yeah, for us, it's been iteratively building and building like that. But at a certain point, I think it's it was a good point that was made earlier. You do need to grow beyond just your accessibility champion or your one person. It needs to become something at a cultural level, um, which of course needs buy-in and all as well. But um, education, is not super expensive um, in the space too, and there's things you can do to upscale on that, um, even at a minimum level. And actually just on that education piece, like as you said, you know, there are some trainings that aren't as expensive as others, but there's also loads of free webinars and free trainings, and I mean DQ, um, the gurus, <laughs> I'm sure that's been already said this morning, but uh, they run a fabulous, like three-day conference every year, and there's so much learning in that, and that really helps build a culture as well. Um, so. uh, thank you, Sorka. Um, coming back, Brendan, uh, to you, you've mentioned, and, and, and it came, uh, came after, uh, also from um, uh, what Bridget was saying, that you need this kind of accessibility culture within the organization, that it's not just a project from, from, from A to B, but you need like the, 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 the whole outlook of the organization um, paying attention to the accessibility matters. It was probably easier for, for, for Cuba to become experts on the accessibility since you were working with NDA on their own website, so you couldn't really cut any corners here and, and also for the center of, of excellence. But uh, how would you convince uh, for this holistic approach um, your, your, your clients? How would you, I don't know, you work also with, I believe, Tato. How would you convince the CEO of Tato, Crisps, why, why, their, why their website should be, uh, should be accessible? We don't anymore, but um, <laughs> uh, that's a good example though. But um, yeah, I think, that, I think that's a really interesting point because, like I said, we went on a, a real journey by working with the NDA too. So, and, and a huge amount, obviously, like I've worked in front-end development for 
10 years now and I've had audits come across my desk as this kind of one-stop milestone type of thing. And that's been going on for years, so that's nothing new. But I think what we've seen is when we worked with the NDA in particular, we learned so much about embedding this into the process and the different milestones that that, with that, where that's getting brought in. So in a funny roundabout way, coming full circle, what we learned from them is kind of almost the same way we're trying to educate our clients in the same way. But like buy-in, like you said, is it boils down to a few things, I think. I think we've talked again, again already today about user engagement, and I think some of the, the numbers that John gave earlier, even around, if I went to a, to a, like an upper management person inside of any of our clients' companies, and I said that there was this many people that are potentially being affected negatively, and we see like the issues you might come across with screen readers in demonstration as well. Like if a client of mine or a management or a manager got in touch saying, this really crucial part of my website, I can't use. That would be a massive, massive issue. So there's ways of demonstrating it in a way that s shows how important it is. But I think that internal education, like we, we like look to educate our clients. We give them content guides in terms of creating accessible content. We look to do that as well. And I think there was a point made earlier again about passion, and that kind of comes out of that too because it is a really interesting space. And the more people that get involved within any organization, it goes up and down the tree naturally from there. Uh, we've seen that, and we've seen that with clients that we now have long-term relationships with, and you know we're working with them on in terms of their design systems, in terms of suites of websites, not necessarily just one website. Um, and this is at the forefront of all of it. And the other thing that kind of helps is just embedding it into our process, which then in, in secondary comes into theirs by default, because it's built into the website project process we do anyway. So it becomes normal to them and, and part of it. And then they kind of learn along that journey at the same time as well with us while we kind of describe them through it. Um, thank you, Brendan. And uh, yes, Mick? Yeah, just to add to that, I think um, getting uh, leadership uh, approval is, is vital. You can have accessibility champions, uh, accessibility engineers, but if you don't have that kind of shadow from the top, then um, it's very, very difficult. It's, it's, it's difficult to influence developers, designers, unless there's like goals from the very top. And I think having leaders um, see the actual issues, like any, everyone that's seen Brian's demo today, all of a sudden it, there's a click. There's a, a kind of a, yeah, uh, this is why we should do it. I think that's, that's very important. And then I, I think it always helps to have some CIO like John who, who, who then can come and boast about being 13th uh, most compliant website. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, uh, let's hope. Uh, was, it, uh, was it always excellence over compliance at the, at the OG CIO or uh, was there a little bit of effort needed to convince the, 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 the top person uh, to, 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 to go beyond uh, just what is required to what is desired? Well, uh, just talking about the culture, I mean, we, Barry Lowry and, you know, obviously we're working with uh, Trevor in, in Dependor as well. I mean, uh, and then my team, uh, they're all content designers in QA. To be honest, you know, it, when you have that from the top and they are passionate about it, it just breeds that and it creates that culture. So I am echoing what's been said already and I'm nodding away because that's how it is in OGCAO. And, you know, as I say, it may, it, it may not have been like that at the very start, but as I say, this is all learning and it is part of a journey. So, you know, it, we are where we are now, what I've displayed on the screen earlier, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it is, it's all just part of a journey. And, and to be honest, they are uh, definitely uh, passionate about it and that breeds passion in, in, all, in the rest of us, you know. Uh, thank you. Um, the culture is one thing, but then it comes to the, to the daily grit uh, of, of, of the work, and um, it was mentioned also previously, but I'd like to, 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 to ask Mick uh, here, uh, you've been involved in the front-end development for more than seven years within Optum, and uh, you must have come across a number of tools that might uh, be of help. Are they really of, of help, and what is really helpful, what is... Uh, desirable but not necessary in terms of uh, creating the ac uh, accessi um, accessible systems and 
is there is there is there a place for 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 the monitoring tools at all uh, within your work, or is it just something that uh, should be used very very scarcely only at the initial stage of 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 the project? Kind of talk about automated testing. Um, well, in terms of just general testing, there's a lot of free tools that we use off the bat. Like, there's like, everyone has a keyboard. You do keyboard testing. Brian talked about screen readers. There's multiple screen readers now for free in terms of Narrator and VDA, but also a whole accessibility suites on your Android and, and iPhones. So there's to begin with, and then you have multiple browser plugins, um, color contrast tools, again, all free. Automated tooling, uh, automated testing um, can be helpful for sure, um, but it comes with a caveat in my opinion. Um, it, there, there's no shortcut to uh, creating accessible, usable sites. Uh, there's no quick flick of a switch. Um, generally, automated or testing will, will show about 30% of issues that, that come through WCAG. Um, that's, that's from my experience. Uh, so if you're getting audits that are automated and getting scores of, of 100%, you're getting 100% of about 30% of the actual potential issues on your site. So would I invest in automated tooling straight off the bat? Probably not. I would invest in an accessibility professional, getting experts in, uh, like Josh, like Brian, um, to start embedding that culture. It comes down to what, what, what's the end goal? Are you thinking short term, trying to uh, tick off a, a, a site, or are you trying to make sure that you're constantly creating accessibility sites? Because an audit is, again, it's a, a score in a moment in time as well. So it's given you that indication. But by the time you come around fixing it, what else have you created? How many sprints are you going through? So I would look at it very much more, what's, what's the end goal, the long goal? How can we embed accessibility into all those practices, design, development, content order, visual design, uh, get someone in to start training. I, the, my role as an accessibility professional, I think it's beginning to change. You're not auditing as much, I think it's much more beneficial that you, you train the people within the organization, that you're training the designers, developers, UX content. You can have a design system that's accessible, Josh Benton's in it. If it's not developed in the right way, then it fails. If the content auditors aren't putting into it, it fails. So uh, I would look at kind of uh, how you want to invest that in the right way. And and uh, um, just to uh, it's, it's very interesting. I, I didn't think that uh, I wasn't aware that it's only thirty percent, more or less thirty percent of issues are picked up by by the automatic uh, testing tools. Why is that? Why why what 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 these tools are missing that um, accessibility professional can can uh, um, can assess? That, that's not an official stat. That's my no, no, my, no, my no, no. But, from your experience, um, yeah. Well, uh, an automated tool can can tell you if your image has alternative text or not, but it can't tell you that it's decorative, that it, it doesn't mean anything, or is that uh, alternative text accurately describing the image? Now that they are getting AI is getting better in terms of that, but. Um, you need that human perspective to say, or from a, a, a it comes from usable, ex, uh, usable, accessible products as well. Is the alternative text really describing what it's intended? So there, there's a lot of aspects like that. Uh, thank you very much, Mick. Um, any any other um, uh, examples of the tools that you've been using that that you found particularly helpful, or or a warning not to use something? Uh? Um, well, just a second to. To what Mick was saying, because I think that's those are really, really important points to make, um, and the fact that they are tools and they're not solutions. If you're going to incorporate them, it's about res using anything responsibly. It's not, it's not highly different to to any other tools you might use in development or design. But I think the main thing is people get, can get carried away with scores and kind of see that that's like the overall solution. But that it's kind of that in itself goes against the idea of embedding this into your overall thinking and process because it's like a hundred now, and then we're we're there and we're we're there forever. Whereas like we all know that this and from every, what everyone's saying today is this has to be baked into your long term thinking. That being said, yeah, our, our developers, especially the one like we'd have like junior developers come in, for example, they wouldn't have as much knowledge until we get that chance to upskill them and train them. So they're really beneficial for them because 
and it's reducing down the amount of potential things we see come back in an audit because it's something they've been thinking about from the start. So something like Axe Dev Tools, for example, for our developers is really useful for that for that purpose and just catching things because the same way, of course, humans can also miss things. You know, that's the other side of it. So it's not just the automated side. So it's a dual it's a dual thing in that respect. So embracing it to the point where you know you can, I think, is really important. But um, but yeah, there's there's a there's a huge amount of it that just has to be completely manual and, and best case done that way. And just to weigh in on that, like obviously there's the, the manual that you just mentioned and that kind of leads into, you know, engaging with your users, getting getting regular feedback. I know that was kind of said this morning um, on some of the, t the, the little talks that I, that I heard. Uh, but, you know, certainly from us with, within HSE Digital, we do try and uh, go a bit beyond compliance where it's really great that we're at that level now where we can be a bit more, you know, we strive to be inclusive by default. So when we're engaging with users and when, even when we're carrying out, let's say, our audits that we might carry out internally, um, we're looking obviously against the different standards that are available, but we also have great internal um, resources like um, content guidelines that uh, within our organization, we strive for plain English. So, um, you know, there, there's lots of other kind of checks that you can do that aren't just regarding the, the different international standards like WCAG. Uh, thank you, Sorka. And, and let's stay with you. Uh, you mentioned, uh, and, and I know that um, um, you have a particularly um, extensive experience about uh, dealing with the end users and, and getting their engagement in relation to the accessibility aspects of, of the HSE website. Could you tell us a little bit more about the process? Um, sure, yeah, and obviously reel me in if I go off on tangents so you have some notes here. Um, we do engage regularly with our users. It's really important that our content is as accessible to as many different people as possible. Obviously, we're the, we're the, health, uh, the public health organization in Ireland. Um, we carry out you know, indirect, um, indirect and direct um, user engagement. So the indirect might be from gathering insights from some of our in-page widgets. Um, that are, are widget tools, so like um, feedback as the user is maybe navigating through the website. Um, and then the direct feedback mechanisms would be the likes of carrying out you know, in, um, qualitative uh, research, so speaking to our users. Um, we're really lucky we have a good team. We have a big team of user researchers within the digital team. Um, and we're regularly either carrying out maybe one-to-one you know, -one interviews or also uh, looking into um, you know, carrying out focus groups. So for the for the remote uh, si or sorry for the interview side of things for the one to ones, um, it's really important to make sure that we're carrying those out in um, in the ways that that suit our users the best. So that might be um, remote, that might be what they prefer, or we're also really lucky now that we're out of COVID to be able to do in person sessions. Um, we have. We, all, we often have users come into our offices in Corn Market in Dublin, um, and we're also um, working on getting better at uh, you know, carrying out larger scale focus groups. And I suppose the learnings we're getting from those at the moment would be, um, first off, ensuring that we're communicating in an accessible way, so um, again, the, the plain English side of things, uh, but also with different users, maybe you know, the likes of deaf, um, ensuring that we might have an ISL interpreter if that's necessary, um, or uh, we've also carried out sessions with people with intellectual disabilities. Um, sometimes their supporters have been on site, or um, we're also looking at you know creating easy read materials for workshops. So it's just being um, really open about um, checking in with our users, seeing what their preferences are, and then also being flexible with the way we, we carry out our research. And then also, you know, trying to um, carry out our research as often as possible also. It is very much. It is, a, it is extended um, uh, part of this, of this accessibility culture, isn't it? It's, it's going even beyond your organizations to the wider network of, of, of the users. Maybe at this stage we can open uh, the floor to the questions either from online uh, or, or the room itself. Great discussion, uh, everyone. Michael again from Optum slash Accessibility Ireland. Um, and kind of leading on from what Mick and Brendan talked about around 
tooling only getting you so far, and, and tools are tools, but they're not going to give you the overall solution. I'm um, just curious, and kind of for the audience, what what you have done to kind of further that process? So how do you ensure that you're in, in, like in increasing that compliance towards WCAG? And do you, do you um, when you're building your tools or when you're testing, do you test against all the WCAG uh, criteria? Or kind of what, what's the process that you use to ensure there's kind of total, total compliance? Um, yeah, I can go first on that one. Um, so yeah, we would use, we have qualified, I think someone, I think it was Ron from DQ mentioned IAP earlier. So we have qualified um, accessibility testers within the company itself. So that was something that was a big part of, for us to, to upscale in that area. So a lot of what we do is manual testing. Um, but I suppose what we learned biggest to that is when we get kind of two scenarios here. We have brand new projects and we have companies coming to us saying, make this website accessible for us. And we can almost find that like from a budget perspective, that can be exactly the same depending on the website they come to us with. Um, sometimes they're not even responsive, they don't work on mobile, so you're kind of just like from the start, like where, where do we even begin? But um, yeah, so I think in that sense, we do it throughout the whole process. So it even includes just developers reviewing designs, but developers who are now qualified, especially like those QA testers, um, or accessibility auditors even, sorry, but they would be reviewing these, like pointing out elements of the design from a technical perspective that might cause issues um, as well. So a lot of it's manual throughout that part too, and obviously post full content post and pre full go live is like the perfect sweet spot for companies like us where we're delivering websites in between three to six month kind of periods depending on the project needs and so on and so forth where it might not be fully baked into a full organizational design system as much as we love working in that way it's not always possible so we have to work in that kind of way so that's kind of the perfect point because i think one part of this is obviously design is huge development is huge content is a really large part of it and it's almost the biggest thing you will see in between audits so if you're doing them every quarter six months like design development moves no, if you if you see a new template or something every kind of few weeks or something, that's that's great. You could have sixty new pages or changed content within that period of time, and you have content rich editors when people can put in H trees over H twos and no alts, and like, you know, so that that can get completely unwieldy very fast. So, um, yeah, so it's all through that whole education piece again, I think. But um, yeah, we we take other methods like from our perspective, we try to build like a white label, label component library that takes a lot of the technical aspects and kind of has them baked in as much as possible, so that we're starting with something that's fairly accessible out of the box in certain cases. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a huge amount of focus from our from ourselves internally, and always looking at new ways, and kind of honestly always evaluating these new tools as they come out as well, and as as we become aware of them, to kind of see if this is the one that's going to help us really get to the next level. Yeah, and I'll just add a little bit to that. I suppose we we do use tools like X and, and things like that in our process. But uh, if, if I'm being really honest, none of us are native users of assistive technology. So we are not going to be good enough to fully test it. So we do need the, the right people in testing that. So, so that is why we obviously use experts who are native users. Um, like we've seen a lot of stuff come through support, through reports that we thought we had caught through the automation process, we're like, oh, you know, we're happy days, we're like 100%. And next thing, um, the, the likes of Josh will send us on a report and a video telling us, no, no, you know, you're not there. Uh, now, we have improved this because we are using design systems, but, um, but like, again, it's, it's a never ending piece. Like you, you mentioned there, John, it's the bridge. We're going to keep building, um, and it very much is. Everyone has to, has to play their part. Um, and I think that's, that's another thing that you guys have all been calling out quite clearly today. Just to weigh in, I think it is really important, obviously, to get engage with the experts and also uh, native users, absolutely, of different assistive technologies. But um, I'm an amateur user of assistive technology for like maybe we, we carry out very light audits of, um, you know, our components, even being able to, con to kind of um, carry out those audits within the dev environment. And I think that's, it's been so helpful to us and it's really helped certainly within the design skill set, increase um, my kind of design capabilities. So absolutely so important to engage with um, the experts, but also it's, it's really helpful to, to, to play around with um, assistive technology yourself. Once you, once you see how it works, you can design for it. That's it, absolutely. Right. Yep. 
Uh, I hope we have a time for, for one more question. Absolutely. Anyone? We have one online, Ben? Uh, yeah. Okay. So there will be two, two more questions then. Don't worry. <laughs> no, don't worry. I, I, I saw you. Thanks. Uh, online, yeah, anonymous attendee has asked, is there a fear of overdevelopment when trying to build in inclusion? There can be, yeah, over-enthusiastic, um, which isn't a bad thing, but you can create a, a button and overload it with different labels, adding things like ARIA and then an actual label and, and ARIA label by, and it, it, it can, you can get deep in, from a development perspective into ARIA, um, which the first use of ARIA is don't use ARIA, but you can, you can get, yeah, a bit over enthusiastic and, and add that on things, but that's not, it's not a bad thing. You're, you're invested, which is good. It's just um, when it comes to that user testing, testing with assistive technology, you'll learn straight away there's there's things that I've done done a little while wrong. But that's that's my experience. Um, just just to add to that, I I think it, it's the positive innovation that we should be looking at here. Uh, so if we go back to in the physical world, the things like curb cuts, like they came out of uh, designing for a, a disability, and instead it's a case of bikes and buggies and everything. And I certainly used it when I had a buggy. I was wheeling around. Um, so we are actually looking to simplify things. We can either build a curb or we can build a curb cut. So which would we actually prefer to do here? Thank you. Uh, we have one question here. Thank you. Um, Anne-Marie McCullough. I'm an accessibility engineer with WorkHuman. So firstly, thanks. It's been a really interesting discussion so far. Um, my question is around Agile. So obviously, a lot of organizations nowadays are building software in an Agile fashion. You have cross-functional teams, multiple cross-functional teams, all designing and developing and pushing code to production every single day and um, pushing new features to production. In that environment, what do you do to ensure that you're maintaining that high level of accessibility every single day? I can start. <laughs> just to say, I'm actually just going to mention what Virgil in OGCAO said earlier on. By making that change and including it in the design phase um, and, and having, you know, and as I say, it's part of the test of uh, OGCAO formal test suite now, that has made huge, um, a huge uh, difference to, as I say, the, the scores that I would have showed you earlier on, you know, so. Um, I, I definitely find that that by having the you know and, and having all the teams working together uh, collaboratively, we meet regularly, uh, daily stand-ups, and you know um, going through the, the normal SDLC cycle. And I th I think just to play on that, also education. So like you know the more people that you have on your team that have that awareness, that enthusiasm. I see someone in the audience on my team who has that enthusiasm, um, certainly from the dev environment. Like that helps enormously to catch errors and then also to, uh, you know, make everyone aware of them. And just to say that that's, it's normal now. It is normal for everyone. We all have that. And as I say, it's just touching back on the, the whole passion um, because we all have that, you know, in each team, it is normal now, you know, to, to, to um, move forward like that, you know. Yeah, I think it depends on the maturity of your team. Like if it's new to accessibility, that's going to be very difficult, but it's about getting every member trained up so that they're aware that it's not just accessibility champions are wonderful and having an accessibility engineer team is great, but that's one person. So it's going back to that question, how can you put in, you know, a certain amount of checks at design, development, QA content, and then by the time it comes to a sprint level, the audit shouldn't, hopefully, fingers crossed. Have many issues. Uh, right, it's, it's it's clear that this panel could last for for three hours, not just forty minutes. Uh, but before I wrap up, I would like to ask each of our panelists one uh, question. In and please, if you can answer in thirty seconds, you're 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 all very much accessibility champions. But how do you become one? Yep. Shall we start with you, Sorka? I'll take that. Uh, I think the the most important thing is to just be interested in learning and have that enthusiasm and that willingness. And then for everything that you learn, be really interested in sharing it. That's what's worked for me anyway. Brendan? 
Yeah, um, again, I'll go back to that education piece to look for the resources out there, find as much as you can. Um, but even events like this like, are great opportunities to network and speak to other people in the space and learn even more. So I think that and then talking about it within, within your company, being the person to make sure that others know that this is something you want to build into your culture and become a really important part of how things work. I, Bridget? Yeah, and I, th I think if I'm in a very fortunate position. I work for a company that is uh, all about DEI. Um, so I'd say look to who in your company is in that space and, and just learn from them. Uh, I'll just give a quick call out to Niall O'Hanlon, is our accessibility officer. Um, and he's the one who, who is like a guiding light for us in the organization. But he's retiring this year, so uh, make sure you get the best use out of him. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of what everyone said. Uh, passion, probably for me, is the big one. Um, if you're passionate about it, you'll you'll find information out there. There's a lot out there. Um, I'll, I'll shamelessly uh, plug our own network meetup group, Accessibility Ireland, where we we're trying to just promote accessibility in Ireland. So we're getting speakers at meetups and just trying to grow that network. And and if people are passionate, they'll come and you'll you'll learn more. And then I'm just going to say again what was on the, the slide earlier on, you know, having an accessibility expert um, and, you know, uh, including uh, accessibility in uh, and making changes in your in our processes for the better and also then meeting regularly with uh, the NDA, you know, providing advice and just bettering what we're doing. And as I say, we, uh, as we learn, we can only improve, you know. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. I think I can I can sum it up by by a sentence that Sorka um, uh, included in her LinkedIn profile. At at, our, at the at the end of of Sorka's profile, you'll 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 find a, a bit of a motto, which is uh, I love I love finding fixes for A11Y issues. So I think that this could be this could be something that we can we, we can all take forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, my panelists.